Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the USA Volleyball Show. We are the official podcast of USA Volleyball. 91. Episode 91. Episode approaching. 91. Approaching We're nine away. Digit. We're nine away <laughs> from, uh, from 100. And yep. boy, do we have a special 100 episode for you guys. Is that right? Yep. I'm setting the tone. We are we strategically plan a whole hundredth episode for this. A lot of pressure. A lot of pressure. Might be some giveaways. It might be. I'm sorry. I'm just kidding. Could be around the Olympics or Paralympics. Could so it could be fun. Could be a parade. Who knows? You know. Yep. 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 We haven't thought that far ahead, but we Make will have a great episode for that. <laughs> I know it will. Maybe we'll have a new promo or something for Ooh, around that time. We'll see. Good idea. Mm-hmm. We'll see. How how are you feeling traveling back from from the East Coast? I am uh, a little rested. Uh, got a lot of catching up to do um, yep. for an event coming up at the end of May called uh, Open National Championships. But yeah, staying on top of the ball of Baltimore in 18th. How was your first event back from your leave? So, like yeah. you came back from leave. Now you like went straight to an event too. So I know you're feeling it. Yep, definitely feeling it. <laughs> I. Uh, uh, definitely traveling out there like that first night was rough. You never get a good um, night's sleep. Never get, it, yeah, I did not sleep well. Um, but slept better like throughout the trip. And then, yeah, just a long flight, uh, little rough landing, uh, back in Denver, but I made yeah, it was too here. Good. But yeah, it was good. It was fun though. It was fun to get back to events too. I, yeah, I haven't been to an event in quite a while and um love going to 18. It's a lot of great volleyball. Um just a great atmosphere too. A lot of those a lot of those athletes, it's their last club tournament. So they're leaving it all out there. And uh yeah, definitely gets a little emotional there for for the athletes and the parents too. Uh kind of ending their club season, their careers, I guess, with, with their kids. But uh definitely definitely a lot of fun i love 18s and and baltimore was uh i think a great host city too and uh first time i think for for events to for any of our events to go to baltimore as well is that right i think so i'll, just, I'll have to double check that in our little archives but i mean I was, well again my first time in the city first time either in baltimore or a long time but um wow those crab cakes man i Can know it's like this I was going to say crab, got a lot of crab, got a lot of seafood, fish. Yeah, definitely made the most of being on the on the coast there. Uh, and yeah, had our had our coworker, uh, I guess former coworker now, Kelsey Dolphin, who lives in Baltimore now and mm-hmm. got some great recommendations for from her. Who's about uh, to have another group? Wow. That's right. Yeah. Congratulations, Kelsey and, and her husband, Reggie, uh, having another girl. That's fun. Um, but yeah, eighteens was was great. Any um, I guess any uh records <laughs> broken or yeah, <laughs> any records broken or uh, yeah, anything from the like event side of, for for hosting eighteens? Any any fun details like that? Uh, um, not that I can recall off the top of my head. Um, that yeah. actually pretty cool to um kind of look back on. Uh, we have to pull our reports and you know do all of the tenant numbers and stuff afterwards there too. So possibly, but. I'm still not 100 percent sure. Um, I yeah, just know you and Brie killed it across the board, covered it for marketing and um, you know, digital and social media too. So um, it's always good and helpful to have, you know, more than one person there. So you guys can help each other out and while yep. we're all running around doing tournament things, that's also a big thing too. Just be able to look back and uh, you know, see the coverage and creativity from you guys too. So that's always appreciated. Yep. Shout out Brie for helping me out on the social front. That was that was awesome, especially on championship day. Like that's that's a crazy day running from court to court, uh, getting captured in video. But uh, another fun thing that happened at 18s for me was I, I ran into a couple of my college teammates, uh, former college mm-hmm. teammates. Um, so yeah, my my uh, college teammate room and college roommate Matt Morgan. He uh, was coaching his roots team there, uh, based out of Austin. Uh, and they did pretty well, had a good, great tournament. And then, uh, my other friend, Kevin Farrell, uh, actually lives a little outside of Baltimore. So he was able to drive, uh, up from drive up uh, championship day and, uh, and hang out for a little bit. So great to catch up with them. And we talk a lot, a little bit about it with Rob here in the episode, but, uh, just a small world 
uh, that volleyball is and, and great to reconnect and have a little reunion there with my, with my college teammates. Mm-hmm. That's good. Um, trying to think, I mean, outside of the actual tournament too, it's all a blur now. I mean, I know we just had it, but I'm like, wow. Oh, and the, the prom, the 18, oh, prom, yes. 18, 18 yeah. prom went really well. Um, I was checking in teams, the majority of the portion of their team, but I know you guys saw the majority of it. We got there and started acting crazy the last 10 minutes, which is funny, but I mean, it uh, looked like the girls really had a good time. Um, Shout out to the, the the team that dressed up as the Blue Man group. That was amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I didn't get what club they were from. But that, that was amazing. that was cool. They went all out for that. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, that was that was fun and got a lot of great feedback uh, from both the athletes who attended that and then some of the parents too. I had one parent, a dad, come up to a championship desk the next day because the prom uh, prom check in sign was hanging out on one of the crates there at your championship desk, and he was like, "What's the?" what's the prom check-in and i was like oh yeah we hosted a little prom for for the athletes who you know are missing prom back home uh he was like oh that's so cool i didn't know that was going on I was yeah, like, yeah we do it every year and he was like oh good to know good to know so um but yeah definitely a hit and looked like they had a lot of fun there a lot of good music too playing oh, yeah. play, playing some throwbacks from from our era too oh, yeah <laughs> Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good time for sure. Yeah. Prom went well. I mean, championship day went really well too. Yeah. Um, a lot of good matches, high level matches across the board, and uh, just another successful national championship. Now we got to get rolling into the rest of them, and you know, stop it in your hometown. Well, your 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 old stopping grounds. I mean, um, quite a bit in the middle of June, towards the end of June, and then that's right. Whew, Got the last two raw in New Vegas, and then heck, you're off to uh, Paris after that. That's right. Yeah, a lot of great volleyball ahead. But yeah, speaking of Championship Day, just wanted to give a little congratulations to all oh, yes. the gold medal medal winners, medal winners, uh, medal, winners. <laughs> medal, medal winners, medal winners at the 2024 Girls 18s Junior National Championships in Baltimore. Congratulations to. Aspire 18 Black, the American Division Champions. C1 VB 18 1 Heather, the Freedom Division Champions. VVA 18 1 Liberty Division Champions. AZ Sky 18 Gold, National Division Champions. TAV 18 Black, Open Division Champions. And Neva 18 Purple, Patriot Division Champions. And AV or A5, sorry, A5, 18 to USA division champions. A uh, lot of, a lot of hardware handed out on championship day. A lot of great teams there. Um, congratulations to everyone who made the tournament, uh, who got those bids and yeah, hopefully everyone had a great time there. I second everything you said there. So we, <laughs> we wrap that up. That was great. There we go. There we go. And just, let's just keep things moving. Uh, let's jump into now. It is time for news with yous. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Pro Volleyball Federation's inaugural season is coming to a close. Um, matches are going on until May 12th. Okay. Uh, then the 2024 Pro Volleyball Federation Championship will be held on May 15th and the 18th at the CHI Health Center in Omaha. What a venue that's going to be rocking with fans, energy. I mean, I'm just re- I'm just reminiscing to our ABCA national championship and um final four yep. experience there too. So I can only probably no better place be. to have that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's still uh there are still weekly matches streaming for free available on CBS Sports Network. Tune in to make sure you don't miss any of that action there. It's very exciting. And um, as a reminder, hopefully the 24 was up. I was going to say, hopefully better weather, too, because uh, we were there yeah. in, the, in the middle of winter. <laughs> yeah. I'll never forget that drive. Yeah, I've been, in, I've been, to, the, I've been to Omaha in the summer. It's it's nice. So uh, <laughs> hopefully they have good weather there. And yeah, it was windy and cold when we were there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Windy, cold, snowy. What a drive. All right. Back to news. Uh, as a reminder, 2024 Beach National Championship registrations are now open. I'm registered for all of these events, and this one specifically on the beach side of things. If we go to hotter weather to summertime, uh, for your chance to be the next national champion, 
registration is also open for two more um, Beach National Team trials. Um, <clears throat> visit our website to sign up for a chance to represent the U.S. at either the Beach U19 World Championship or the Beach World University Championship. Tickets are available for the USA Volleyball Hall of Fame taking place May 22nd in Columbus, Ohio. Make sure you join USA Volleyball as we celebrate all-time greats such as Kathy DeBoer, Carl McGown, Dane Blanton, Robin Amo, and friend of the pod, Reed Free. Tickets are available on our website, usavolleyball.org. Uh-oh. Without any news here, the NCAA Men's Volleyball National Championship is going on right now through May 4th in the best city of all, LBC, Long Beach, California, at Walter Pyramid. You can watch all the action there on ESPN Live and in action. Good luck to all those teams competing, but also shout out to all of our NTDP athletes who made the All-American teams. Uh, first team, Mason Briggs, Ethan Champlin, Camden Gianni, uh, Merrick McHenry, Andrew Rowan, Nicholas Slight, and Parker Van Buren. Shout out to that whole, those gentlemen who made the first team. First team All-Americans there. Second team mentions are Toby Ezioni, Aiden Knight, Jackson Hickman, Ryan Merck, Brand the Pod, Jacob Pasture, Cole Power, and Will Rotman. We also have a few honorable mentions to shout out. First up, we have Clark Godbold, Dylan Klein, Nicodemus Meyer, Kyle Paulson, Owen Rose, Shred Rosenthal, and Shane Wetzel. Shout out to these gentlemen who received honorable mentions. The NCAA Beach Volleyball National Championship is May 3rd through the 5th in Gulf Shores. Make sure you watch on ESPN Networks for live action and see who will be the next national champion. Follow along the action on USA Volleyball social media. And for more on all of the latest news, visit usavolleyball.org. Or going to throw it right up, right back to Steve Vind to introduce today's guest. And he's a good one. It was a great conversation we had, too. So I'm going to let you take it away from here. Yeah. Great job with the news. We got a lot a lot going on right now in the Bali world. Uh, exciting time. Tell, don't tell them how many takes to. <laughs> <laughs> exciting time for to be a volleyball fan, uh, for sure. But, yeah, now on to today's show, we sit down with volleyball MC Rob Aspero, a.k.a. Rob on the mic. Rob is an announcer for several USA Volleyball National Team and Beach events, as well as on the mic at ABP events, NCAA men's events, and is the host of the Viral Volley Podcast. Rob talks about his background in volleyball and beach volleyball. He talks about his experience announcing for NCAA, previews the men's volleyball national championship, as well as the beach national championship, too, uh, and so much more in that conversation. Such a great uh chat that we have with rob so let's just jump right into it enough from us here is rob on the mic rob thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with us we're really excited for this conversation a really exciting time in volleyball both on the men's indoor side and beach as well uh the collegiate ranks but yeah thank you so much again for for taking the time to chat with us totally an honor to be on board with all you guys and i appreciate all you guys are doing it keep volleyball in the uh, public eye because we know that the coverage is there's definitely lack of coverage. So I appreciate anyone who does any kind of press and media, digital content and is able to get the incredible personalities that are in our game out there because you get to know their stories. You can't help but follow them and just root for them wherever they're at. Exactly. Yeah. Definitely like a lack of coverage, like you said, but also ramping up of uh, volleyball is it's growing, it's growing. especially on the women's indoor side with the, the getting on some of the bigger networks uh at the college ranks and then um the pro leagues coming up here yeah. soon too you know and, and growing so uh hopefully can move some of that over into the beach and men's side too uh get on those bigger networks and get some coverage and uh but until then we'll keep doing our work here uh and I'm sure you'll just keep doing your work too. <laughs> I know I, I got to pass the torch somewhere I gotta <laughs> relax and go on vacation and every once in a while and retire vacation what what's that what is that <laughs> never heard of those before i'm just kidding um, 
I, I, I love, I would love to just dive right into announcing and, you know, as we were about to probably do that in a little bit, but um, let's talk about the game of volleyball overall. How were you introduced to the game of volleyball? Like, you know, were you a player back in the day? Um, what was your introduction to that? I was there when William Morgan invented the game because I'm that old. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us more about that. Yeah, what were those <laughs> early days of volleyball? <laughs> Um, actually, so it's funny. I was a, I was raised to be a baseball player, you know, uh, from grades three on was hardcore into baseball and was doing the whole, uh, pony to all stars, traveling teams and all that. And then one day at my junior high school, I happened to see this little sand pit that was also a really big kitty litter box. I'm like, Oh, what are, what are those guys doing? And there at the time it was the 30 by 30 court on the uh the, the, the sand, so it's old school. And I'm like, that looks fun. Started getting into it more and more. And you know, it was like, I can do this. I, I have a you know, I think I like playing this three contact game that we're just getting our hands stuck in the net and you know, thinking we can clobber people on the other side of the net, not getting calls or anything, but um just enjoyed playing volleyball uh on the sand, you know. And then they started introducing it more uh, for the, in our field house using an indoor, which is a concrete, you know, scuff your knee up every time you go on the ground and get a couple stitches here and there. But I still had a great time. And um, yeah, I naturally took to the second contact person. Didn't realize at the time I was called a setter. Yeah, I wasn't, I loved hitting, you know, but couldn't get above the net. Blocking for obvious reasons, still couldn't get above the net because I was just a, little tyke and um but i love getting that second ball and setting people up so it, it was a uh, natural to for me to just jump in as a setter playing volleyball right at the get-go what sort of um i guess transit what helped you in your transition from baseball to volleyball do, do you remember that at all or, interesting one you yeah we, we don't have many baseball to volleyball uh people in this game i, I don't think Overcoming the disappointment from my parents <laughs> saying that. <I'm> more <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, because I also was a big surfer too. Uh, oh, yeah. and it was just natural, you know, where I grew up in Newport Beach and uh, to when you're done surfing, <laughs> hit the volleyball court. So uh, I think they kind of knew that, that the beach culture that I was raised in, it was just a natural bit. And that just happened to take it on more than my other friends who are in other sports. You know, basketball was fun, but not really my big gig. Football was fun. But again, I just something about being on the beach and playing volleyball was so just right for me. Mm. I think you uh, I think you bring a very interesting point when you talk about culture and volleyball, especially beach volleyball. Um, Can you talk about like, you know, the community, the friends you made, you know, are some of those friends, you know, lifelong friends you still talk to this day? It's very unique in the in the beach game when we talk about that. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, I still keep in touch with my uh, my high school teammates because they happen, you know, a handful of them are still in the area and they've continued on like marrying wives who happen to be volleyball players without them knowing it. And, uh, they've stuck in the game and all that. So it's been an exciting time to go out to, let's say, you know, I'm really close to Huntington beach, the Newland courts. There's a lot of club tournaments and uh, colleges competing in their duels. And I'm like, Hey, that's, that's my old teammate. I'm like, what are you doing here? Who was it? Is a police officer too. I'm like, it's like, yeah, I'm a volunteer assistant. My wife's a coach of this team over here. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, just being able to see their involvement in the game. And um, in this community where I live, I live in a beach community. So a lot of people do play volleyball anyways. Um, so everyone's super tight and they know each other just from showing up on the beach with a ball, you know, show with a bag of, you know, I won't say the brand balls because I know you have a sponsor here, but you know, they'll show up with a bag. Like, you play volleyball? <laughs> and that, this is the, the good one. I come home. I've got my USA volleyball backpack on my back, coming back from an event I work. And uh, well, a woman's walking her Frenchie and says, what's your connection to USA volleyball? I'm like, um, I, I'm an announcer broadcaster. She goes, what's your name? I'm, it's Rob. Just, oh, my gosh, you're Rob on the mic. My daughter. Awesome. You. <laughs> That's you cool. In our neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> right up the street. So, but it's it's just the community is, is small but big in the same respects. 
because I, I never want to limit it to just where I'm at because in, in my travels, I've come to know a lot of players across, gosh, I was going to say the nation, but really the world. And there are people who I stay in contact pretty regularly just to send a note of encouragement of results or just see them plan. And, um, you know, I, I think it's just whatever, wherever volleyball is at, I'm on it. So now mm-hmm. uh, the community, what you, I used to think was a very small community over the miles is a huge one, but it's definitely a smaller community with the relationships that I have for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Small, but big. And, and there's always some connection, uh, with whoever you're talking to, whoever you run into, uh, uh, in the community, I was on a plane with my wife. We're going to, you know, a honeymoon trip, and uh, I had my USA volleyball backpack as well. And the woman next to us was like, "Do you know Jordan Poulter by chance?" <laughs> and I was like, "Yeah, yeah, Jordan's great." And she, uh, her daughter, the the woman's daughter, played volleyball with Jordan, club volleyball with her. Wow. Uh, just happened to be on our flight and are sitting next to us in our row. <laughs> so, yeah, just another example of small but big community there. Yeah. Yep. Oh, without a doubt. And I loved your story about your friend who's a police officer. I feel like once you're in volleyball, you you don't you can't get out. You're always in. You're always in. <laughs> it's just how much you're in, not to be. No, that's really cool to hear. Um, can you talk a little bit about just how you were first uh the first connected with USA volleyball? Well, that goes back to two thousand six. And that year, uh John Spara was the head coach at UC Irvine. And he obviously was an assistant at the time or helping out with a men's program being there based about 10 miles up the, up the freeway in Anaheim. And, uh, he wanted to host USA events and some international events in the Brent event center. So, you know, I happened to, I'm trying to remember actually it's USA Argentina. Now I think about it was the first international match that was hosted in there. And I met a, woman by the name of Melissa Weymouth at the time. Yeah. So, uh, and Mike Chandler. So I uh, did some, you know, since I was the in-house PA announcer, they used me for the event and Mike gave me his card and said, Hey, can we use you for some other stuff? And I said, sure. Is that local? Like, no, no, you'd be traveling around. So I was introduced to that. And at the time they had me go to world league. Oh, cool. So, and that was, pre VNL for all you wondering what world league yep. was. And that was such a great experience because that it was then that I got my, to wet my appetite for the international style of play and really be exposed to some of the, the great international players, both on the men's and women's sides. And it's like looking at, at the people that I was in front of, like seeing the seven foot two Russians and come in and um, I'm like, what I can meet those people for sure. I'm in. So and then Mike Chandler moved on and then Melissa Weymouth stayed with USA Volleyball and kept a really good relationship with her. And I'm telling you, that is one of the hardest working women that I know in the volleyball world. So uh, I'm thankful that I have this relationship with her and that she you know, can trust me to go work USA Volleyball events and DNL and all these major Olympic qualifiers because it's without her and um, her ability to, to recommend that I be a part of that. Uh, I think that's where I get my fire for USA Volleyball, just that opportunity that she's given me to be a part of USA Volleyball. Shout out Mel. Yeah, we love Mel here at USA Volleyball as well. And yeah, like you said, one of the hardest working uh, people at, at USA Volleyball and in the volleyball community too. Uh, and you're talking about that. But yeah, yeah one of uh, oh, social media, media people are you know, so. Oh yeah, <laughs> it puts, me, it puts me to shame. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just on my phone the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I guess, yeah, stay on announcing what you talked a little bit about, you know, where you started with USA volleyball and announcing and, and, you know, before that, but what's, I guess, what hooked you, uh, with announcing, like what kept you in, uh, that field? Yeah, I think when I first came into announcing, I, I mean, the way I got into it was by happenstance. I was a lines official trying to pay for my college education and they just said they wanted a voice and cause they, you know, the announcer didn't show up. So there I was, and that was my first year of very, very many. But then as I, you know, had this natural love for the game of volleyball, I felt that something was missing on an excitement side. I'm not saying that the play wasn't exciting on its own, but I felt like it could be enhanced. 
in the fan experience. So I started incorporating more of the colorful um, euphemisms, analogies, sayings, pop culture type sayings, uh, lyrics to songs in calling the batches. And that started to really pick up. And I started to get even more work, not only at UC Irvine, but various junior, uh, high school juniors, pro events, and then obviously to USA Volleyball. And that's kind of helped me um, really get a, a huge energy for it, seeing the, the crowd enjoy it, not because of what I'm saying, but enhancing what the, our phenomenal athletes are doing on the court. And that's what really gives me the big stoke is seeing that these athletes are being recognized for their efforts and for what they're doing on the court. I mean, because I mean, it's not a knock on the play in the early 2000s, 80s, 90s, but reality of it is we're seeing some of the most phenomenal play right now at such young levels. And I want to bring that to attention. I'm, I'm hoping that what I do brings attention to that play that gets uh, the game recognized on a much higher level. Hopefully, getting some kind of a expansion of the game in so many areas that people can watch more and more volleyball and get on board. Do you only stick to volleyball across the board, or do you kind of venture into other sports or other, uh, you know, businesses that that you know need an MC announcer type of thing there, or is it just strictly volleyball? Yeah, the occasional wedding ceremony, I'll jump on. <laughs> I can see it. Just see a wedding going on on the beach. Jump in, grab the mic. Yeah. <laughs> First time. <laughs> yeah. Um, I actually, so I, I kind of did it all in the beginning. Um, I've done my baseball, water polo. I had a stint with the LA Clippers. Um, but what year, it, what year were you? I'm sorry to cut you off. What year were you with the Clippers? Two, 2005, 2006, I think. Ah, okay. It was in the yeah. 2000s. Yeah. So I was doing stuff with them there and actually made some really good connections and actually some of the relationship, other PA announcers and hosts, I still keep in contact from there today. So, um, but I've definitely done my share of other sports and, um, and MC events and award ceremonies and all that. But I think now I'm really hyper-focused on volleyball. And even now I'm realizing I, I may have to go even more specialized in that because of, how fast the game is growing, the, the demand for something uh, like an MC host or even a play-by-play, which is you know, what I've evolved into, has grown exponentially. So, and there's there's lots of capable people who can do it, and I'm, I'm thankful for the opportunity, but I just, I can't spread myself that thin. You know? <laughs> <laughs> now, as you're talking about specialization, which one would you be leaning towards of that road there? We're making you pick now, so you got to tell us what you one of the questions that I have a hard time deciding on because, yeah, you know, the MC hosts, particularly the way that that I've learned in the last like decade or so, based on the volleyball world FIVB VNL beach format and indoor and all that, they want to have more crowded engagement, which I am all about. I love doing that thing. In fact, a shameless self promotion plug. I'll be MC host at the NCAA Men's Volleyball Championships for the semis and finals coming up in Long Beach on May 4th. <laughs> but um, I I like that part. I mean, it's high energy. I love getting people excited for the game. And I like that, you know, hype it up as much as I can. However, there's also the play-by-play side. I just can't stop talking about the play. I like bringing attention to not only just the play, but the um, even just some of the off-court stuff accomplishments of some of the players getting their uh, what makes them tick type thing on the broadcast or even backstories i like to bring in the knowledge of the game what's happening in the game mechanics techniques but also to bring a personalized segment to that based on players backgrounds and just by the nature of being where i've met in the game i i, can't, I know a, quite a bit of people and i'm my analyst also knows a lot of people so between both of us we'll have some kind of Dirty little tidbit or even some nice little note on each of the people we're focusing on. So um, it's just a great fit. I love them both. It's hard for me to pick. You know, if I had to, you know, pick one, I'd like, uh, I'm not going to do that to myself uh, because I know that there's so many good opportunities that it means making the event. Giving 150% of myself making the event better, I'm 
I'll do whatever it takes. I mean, if you want me in playing DJ, which I'm a horrible DJ, I'll do it, but I'll do my best. <laughs> I think some events you've you've had to wear both hats, right? DJ and <laughs> yeah. uh, MC. The budget was tight. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. I remember that. Um, yeah, kind of staying on on that is, and I appreciate what you do as well. You're talking a little bit about it there, but you know your efforts help grow the game as well for those listeners, those viewers who are watching volleyball. It's not just bump set spike that they're watching, but they're listening to your commentary and hearing more about the players, hearing more about the game. So yeah, definitely appreciate all the energy and effort and passion that you put into what you do. Well, there is so many excellent athletes that have great stories and, you know, there's, uh, you know, one of my favorites is, um, so, there's this little blonde haired girl watching courtside at the UC Irvine men's volleyball matches. And, uh, her brother happens to be an outside hitter for UCI and pretty good player too. But this little girl is always at all the matches. Turns out this little blonde haired girl was a pretty good baller herself. Uh, her name was Sarah Hughes. <laughs> <laughs> little, little name there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, so from that connection, I got to see her play in high school, win a couple CIF Southern Section Championships indoors, and then she showed up in all these magazines on the beach. I'm like, Sarah, I had no idea you were eight all around the beach, too. <laughs> That's cool. That's awesome. That's a fun story. <laughs> uh, well, you mentioned it. You did a little plug in there uh, for the NCAA men's, but let's talk more about that. You're going to be at the Pyramid April 30th through the 4th a venue that you're very familiar with. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, you know, what it means to have the NCAAs there at Walter Pyramid? Well, it's a big deal in Southern California. And if anyone's been to the Walter Pyramid, or let's just say Long Beach as a whole, but that community supports volleyball. Yeah. Um, Alan Knipe and his uh, ed- athletic staff there, they've been supporting, and even his coaching staff, are huge supporters of USA Volleyball. You know, they offer up that venue there, any facilities, connections they've got to get events hosted in there. And it's a great community. You've got Long Beach community. It's, it's literally the center area between Los Angeles and Orange County. And it's it's a doable drive if you're from San Diego or Santa Barbara in that area. But um, being that Long Beach State is a, <laughs> it's a great rivalry matchup for the school that employs me, which is UC Irvine. But you know, in the end, we all love the game of volleyball. And Al and I actually go way back. Um, he actually, one of my high school teammates was his college teammate. And, uh, you know, he's got ties to the local community college as well. I'm super connected with that staff as well, which the junior college championships are coming up this week. That's right. <laughs> yeah. I'll be at on <laughs> Thursday night if I can make it there on time and on Saturday night for the championship match. But, um, yeah, there's just an excellent support community there. And those people love their volleyball. The Pyramid is a great venue. 5,000 people strong. Last national championship um, sold out. You know, standing room only. And big hype. They've got an excellent Terraflex floor, which I believe they'll have to change out, though, for the national championship. But, you know, it's still one of the best places to play. And there's a great, supportive, high-energy, enthusiastic crowd there. And they're going to show up regardless of who's playing. So uh, it's going to be a fun time. And with the teams that are going to be there this year, I it's going to be nothing short of phenomenal. I think that's a good little segue into talking about the teams that are going to be there this year. I mean, we're up to eight teams now, too. I know last year uh, we were at seven. Be a little about, way to balance out the tournament there, too. So uh, what's your take on that? Yeah. Woo! Wow. Well, Funny that we were recording now. I literally just got off my <laughs> college volleyball weekly beat uh, men's top 20 podcast recording with like my, my crew. And um, I get the insight of this coaching staff uh, that decides to participate weekly and hearing their take on what we could see this week. And that's going to, I'll drop name drop there. Brad Roster of UC San Diego, Theo Edwards of CSUN, Dan Brand of Lewis, and Jay Hosick of George Mason. They've been on the podcast now some two years, some up to six years, five years, six, I can't even count. But, you know, what we've all come to realize is this year we're seeing some of the most competitive play, not only what used to be only on the Western side of the United States, but we're seeing teams really rise up in the Midwest and the East Coast, even the Carolinas. And for the first time ever, 
you're going to see a SIAC, the South, uh, Southeastern Eastern Athletic Conference team. That is the HBC Conference. Six teams, actually, I think we'll be expanding, but their first ever auto berth into the tournament. That's Fort Valley State. Larry Rather is doing a great job at Fort Valley State. So they're going to come in at the number eight seed, and it's historic. Um, they've gone through the process of being able to get that automatic berth and have uh, uh, played an incredible season over in the SIAC and actually ventured out and played some pretty top-end schools in the Midwest and the East. So you got that growth. You got Belmont Abbey from the Conference Carolinas, uh, another good team. Then you start seeing some of the familiar names like Ohio State, Penn State, and then UC Irvine, Grand Canyon, it's their second appearance ever. They won their first MPSF championship over the weekend. And of course, you got Long Beach State and UCLA. Um, this year, you've seen in the MIVA, which is the Midwest Intercollegiate Volleyball Association, that conference was one of the most unpredictable conferences this year because of the competition. You had, you know, fifth place teams upsetting the first place team, new number one, and then you know, Loyola was injured, so you have Ohio State beating up. It just was a hot mess, and no one could predict anything out of there. So after that brawl and a couple upsets through the conference tournament, Ohio State ends up in there, which ironically started up number in the top five in the nation at the beginning of the season. So it all settled itself at the end, but I mean, it, up until that point, it was unpredictable. So Yeah, and just... Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to note, because uh, you brought up uh, Fort Valley and the HBCUs, uh, SIC, SIAC. But um, yeah, back in 2019, we've talked about it on this podcast before, but back in 2019, USA Volleyball and First Point uh, Volleyball Foundation, which is John Spraw's, uh foundation, uh, got together and, and did a million dollar grant to um, support the SIAC and adding men's volleyball. Uh, so like you said, historic, uh, to bring in eight teams and for Fort Valley to be that eighth seed, uh, to come into the tournament that it's awesome and, and just shows more growth of the game. And fortunately, after seeing what's happened this year, a minimum of four good teams are left out of this NCAA tournament. And right. it's unfortunate yeah. because I think of all the years I've been following collegiate men's volleyball. We've seen a shift of the number one at least five times in a 16 week season. Wow. So, um, you know, uh, you know, you had stories like Hawaii, you know, they were a front runner favorite, not only in the Big West Conference, but in the uh, NCAA tournament. And then, tra- not, well, it is tragic. They lost their uh, all American outside hitter, who's known as the Greek freak, my favorite mm-hmm. name, but Spiros Hakas. Um, on match point of a tournament, not even a conference match, a tournament they were playing in. And that changed their uh, direction towards the end here and uh, ended up not qualifying. But I can't help but wonder if they were fully available, if, if Spiros was fully right. available, what they could have done. And and realistically, the Big West Conference could have had two at large just along with the auto birth because it was that good. So, but the, the play has been amazing this season across the nation. You know, can't, you know, John Sparrow's UCLA team is a you know, powerhouse without a doubt. But then you have Matt Worley's Grand Canyon Lopes. You know, they're doing some things that last year, they just proved last year wasn't a fluke. They came back and had a four loss season and were, were competing in the uh, MPS tournament this weekend and upset the number one seed ucla so. that's right you won their first title too in, in ps yep, uh, yep, first title yeah um i'm specifically looking forward to that match when you play uh, ohio state i mean we have a friend of the pod jacob pastor who's been on here too such an incredibly athletic individual um great guy smart volleyball knowledge to the roof and man i just i'm i'm very interested to see how they get how that match plays out for sure i think that's one of the ones on my radar but Really, we need to make sure I watch for sure. Well, Clarence, Jacob Pastor is a good, good dude. And I love watching him play. And, you know, funny story there, you know, because I follow social and see the news on there. And, you know, there was a uh, footage that came up on social media that, you know, watch this serve by Jacob Pastor, uh, 80 miles per hour. And I'm like, uh, I put a comment on there. <laughs> is that really 80 miles per hour? The Libro who got the ball said, 
I can confirm that was it. <laughs> Screen. Yeah, it, it was definitely in the conversation for uh, ABCA Player of the Year, and unfortunately, he got slowed with a knee injury after the first point collegiate challenge in Austin. But that wasn't before UCLA upset then number one UCLA. So you know, Ohio State is one of those MEBA teams that created all that havoc in that conference. They took down UCLA, which I'm like, oh my gosh, is this legit here? Um, Because they've got what Kevin Birch is doing there. He's got some really big players that can play some serious ball. So <clears throat> Jacob Pasher definitely is one of the favorites to watch. Uh, I know he's in the USA pipeline, so it's always good to see him mm-hmm. rocking the red, white, and blue. Yeah, he's just totally yeah. fired out, too. I'm, I'm just, I, I've even thought about trying to go back home and watch some of the matches live while uh, uh, while they're in Long Beach. I mean, I'm born and raised in Long Beach, too. lived in Colorado Springs now, but it's just a... Shabble schedule is a little hectic too, so I'm trying to work that one out. <laughs> yes, yeah, just gotta go to the LBC, you know. Mm-hmm. You got to <laughs> had a nice direct flight from the Springs to uh, Long Beach Airport uh, right away. So I'm, I'm I'm looking into it, but not looking too likely. <laughs> we'll be streaming on NCAA.com. Just remember that. So I'm, I'm watching no matter what. Know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, looking at these matchups, do you have uh, you know a favorite that you're just you you're dialed in on that you really want to check out? Well, I mean, just, you're going to watch all of them, but yeah. up close and personal, but is there anyone that you're looking at like with a finer uh, lens? Well, as a graduate of UC Irvine, and I think everyone knows this, I'm a UCI homer, but I, I hide that as much as I can. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I'm a fan of volleyball. And, yeah. You know, it's, it's at a point in the game where it's hard to root for teams because you get to know the people, the, the coaching staff. So I just want to see a hard butt battle. I want to see a hundred percent effort. And I love seeing the battles and whatever the results are like, yeah, I'd love to see Irvine win their fifth national championship. But I mean, given the competition, you know, it's going to be insanity. Mm-hmm. Um, if, uh, if there are a match that only went three sets, I'd be really surprised beyond the, uh, um, uh, semifinals. So, um, these teams are very well dialed in. They've got a lot of talent and the coaching staffs are so talented. I mean, seeing the kind of planning that they're doing and making adjustments and sure though, there's some that'll say just going with what Scott is here, but you know, they're making little tweaks and adjustments. Let's just be real. They're watching volumetrics and the huddle and they're, they're charting. They're not going to fool me for a second. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, can you give us and the listeners like any teasers that you you know any notes that you're pulling that you're gonna that you're gonna have up uh, in your in your notebook as as you announce these events, announce these matches. Um, that's a hard one. Then. Any backstory or anything that you're any fun stories that you're pulling for the athletes or coaches? You just submitted a tie to UCI. Well, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> well, so uh, Pavlik is like in his 100th season of coaching. No, third <laughs> year. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, I think all the coaching staffs, they don't get enough credit for what they're doing. I mean, you know, look at Pav, who's been doing it as long as he has it. I, I, it's incredible when he jokes. He's like, Rob, these, you know, whenever I interview him online, it's like these, these trophies behind me are mine. They're my wives. Here she coaches a junior. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like these national championship trophies aren't mine. But uh, seeing what he works with, I mean, for this almost three decades now is phenomenal to see. And then obviously you got, you know, uh, Alan Knipp of Long Beach State just recorded his 400th career win at Long Beach State. Um, he's got a great crew there. And uh, if there's uh, there are players specifically to watch out for at Long Beach State, um, such as Shapanis. Uh, he's a Cypriot or from Cyprus, for those who don't know what a Cypriot is. But he, is, it's the, he has the ability to create havoc and get point scoring opportunities. And it's pretty amazing to see that happen. Um, and just the fact his son, Aiden Knipe is a starting setter on that team. And just seeing his career since, I mean, being a local boy, he's from Huntington Beach, got to see Aiden play all through high school club and now at Long Beach State. But just the change that he's gone through watching him commit to the game uh, and get to the highest level is pretty cool to see. Uh, for UC Irvine, so Halir Heno has been doing some phenomenal things offensively. And he's one of those guys that's so creative on the attack. You know, he's got... I call it the Home Depot selection of shots. Every single <laughs> tool you want, he's going to do it. Cool. And he's going to use it. So, and um, the French national team is going to be getting a phenomenal get this left-handed outside hitter because technically, 
is, is dominant in should be at, put on the right side, but he's, you know, leading the nation or second in the nation and kills hitting well over 450. Um, just the other night in the semifinal match against Hawaii, you know, over 25 points, he hit over 500 and, you know, at, he's kind of taken off a little bit from the service game, but he's still ninth of the nation. At one point, he, he led the nation last year at 0.88 aces per set. And, you know, he's, but he's turned it up offensively this year. Um, Grand Canyon, Camden, Camden Gianni. I mean, I, let's face it, his story, he was dead for a little bit uh, before trading his first year at college. And his remarkable story and having open heart surgery, getting things right, training for a year, coming back and becoming a four or five time. He's been there for a while because COVID's kind of messed things up. I'm still kind of right, trying yeah. to figure everything out, but I believe he's now a five year All American. Um, and that's a, and he's in the USA program as well as an opposite hitter. But, you know, he's doing some pretty phenomenal things. He got setters like Nick Slight, also in the USA program from Grand Canyon, um, and a ton of talented guys at UCLA. I don't even know where to start with them, but you know, Ethan Champlin's one of the names because he's just one of the guys that does a lot for that team, leadership wise and talent wise. And he's not the biggest hitter. You know, he's probably not the most powerful, but his leadership on the court and his consistency has made him one of the most highly respected players in the game, not only as an athlete, but as a coach and as a fan too. So, you know, and I know I'm missing out a lot and I'm so sorry, all you guys. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. That was more than I expect. Thank you for sharing all that. That, that, that was a great tease for, for the championship coming up here. Absolutely. I'll be courtside for four ma- for the entire tournament on the uh, MCO. <laughs> like I'm uh, just saying, the shameless self promotion. Uh, they'll thing. walk up to you and say, "Hey, you missed it. You, you miss you on Fox." Oh, but I mean, uh, yeah, like like Stephen mentioned, too, that was a really great take, really great insight information on very notable players. Um, and you know, I think uh, you know you do the best you can, but there's too many <laughs> again, too many players and. You know, to to kind of mention here and all that stuff there too, but I'm very excited and very happy for you to be able to be courtside and do your thing on the mic and also just watch some very, like you said, high level, great volleyball across, especially with the tournament there. Well, you know, one thing I didn't get to drop in there, I didn't know where I could sneak it in, more shameless self promotion, but now, but it's not for me. It's because what people don't see, especially in the men's side, I know on the the women's side, uh, media does a great job of promoting the women's tournament. You know, they've got the 64 teams are following up and the coverage just isn't the same for the men's. But in between there, just like the women's, is the All-America Banquet, which I always enjoy um, hosting because I'll be hosting again this year and I'm blessed to have that opportunity just because of it being up the freeway from me. Um, but I like my fifth one. But being able to read the athletes' accomplishments who make the first and second teams is always so cool to see. And you know, because of the amount of talent in collegiate men's volleyball, there's no way you can get everyone. I mean, I know there are are athletes from like the non-traditional volleyball conferences, like Conference Carolinas that get left out, or maybe some people from the MIVA or EIVA. Um, But it just shows that volleyball is growing on the men's and boys side to a level that, you know what, we got to start expanding the honorable mentions, like, you know, because the honorable mention list is deep. But they could easily be in the top one or two of the uh, ABC All America list. <laughs> yeah, like you said, that's just a testament to where the game is now, and and the athletic level from the boys, you know, the grassroots and, and what they're doing at grassroots level, growing the game through the boys all the way up to men's yeah. collegiate. Like that's it's huge, and and hopefully, you know, later down the road we see this tournament bracket just expand and add more teams in because that's going to be that's going to be. You're going to have to at some point. <laughs> yeah. I'd be yeah. like, I I my podcast, like, skip 12. We're going to 16. Yeah. 16. <laughs> That's the round. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like I said, at a minimum of four good teams are going to be are left out of this NCAA tournament. Yeah. And I, it's unfortunate, especially with what the world went through. This is the last of the COVID class. So um, there are guys that have been grinding. And in fact, some of these guys, their programs were on the chopping block. And to see them actually, finish out their careers. I, I wish it could have been a storybook ending had they been able to make the NCAA tournament. Yeah. I was even going to say, just talking about the growth overall, I also coach volleyball on the side. This has been my first year. I'm coaching boys here in the state of Colorado. 
you know, my team's also going to get a chance to um, play at uh, our boys' international championship in um, July. No, excuse me, not July. End of June, right before July happens. And just, it'll be my first time personally seeing what that boys' tournament on the junior end is really like, uh, level of play, my number of teams, and just overall growth of the game from a national standpoint, too. So just wanted to, you know, just echo, second, uh, add to that, what you mentioned there, too. It's just very exciting to be part of the, you know, boys and men's part of the volleyball while that just continues to just tremendously grow every year. Well, first point has been a, doing a great job, Minnesota, Kentucky. I mean, how many states more are are fielding boys volleyball? And I'm waiting for the other states to jump on board, like Texas, hello, Nebraska. Yeah. Uh, step up to Florida, step up to the plate. You know, it's, <laughs> Yeah, it's You're... exciting sport. And uh, the sad thing is um, when I go to beach tournaments, there are no boys or men's beach programs. Yet you see all these boys playing in these like USAV beach championships. And there's good talent out there. Mm -hmm. And if you want, um, you know, obviously that's on the beach side, but these guys are playing indoor also because as I got to talk to them at these places, like, oh, yeah, we're going to our, our high school senior match tonight. I'm like, what? You're, you're playing at an all-day beach tournament, and then your coach is going to let you play tonight, too? <laughs> so, I mean, it's out there. Someone just has to really get it started in those areas. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. I think it really gets segue to me to just talk about uh, the NCAA Beach National Championship that's coming up very, <laughs> very soon as well. I mean, uh, Gulf Place Beach, Gulf Shores, Alabama, uh, Selection Sundays on the 28th of April. Uh, and then, you know, they're rolling May 3rd through the 5th. Um, you know, you, you, you start being, you yourself, excuse me, being part of the, you know, beach volleyball community as a whole. You know, have any takes on there, any comments, feedback uh, to that uh, tournament? Oh, for sure. I, I think this is this is a time of the year that is one of the toughest times of the year for me because I'm torn. It's because <laughs> of the brilliance of having the NCAA men's championships on the same weekends as the NCAA beach championships. Right. So if you look at my social <laughs> posts over the last few years, you will always see the beach up on my monitor while I'm working a match. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not that I'm not paying attention. I'm like, why do we do this to ourselves? Why should we have the two biggest events in each of those disciplines? On the same stinking day. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, you're tapping into each other's fan bases, which does not make sense. And the growth of both the games would benefit of moving them onto different weekends. Uh, if they want viewership, why divide them in half? You know, it's, it's just, you know, there's so many, as with the men, so many incredible athletes on the women's side in beach that are competing on the sand. I mean, if you look at the level of talent, even just five years ago, you know, it was, uh, you had upperclassmen leading the way. Now you're seeing these junior players being raised up through the club system with just as much of a skill set, if not more than those same players. So that's why you're seeing a lot of freshmen, underclassmen competing in the top five flights at each of the top 10 schools. You know, you have great freshmen and sophomore that are in the, you know, as high as the ones, one pairs, and, you know, goes as deep as the fives. You know, it's seeing how good these players are now coming out of all this training and all the beach um, championships that are happening throughout the nation on multiple beaches. I, I do air quote that because beach is on the coast, coast for me, but you've seen all these sand courts pop up in the Midwest, in you know, Wisconsin, over in New York, in inland or in Pennsylvania, and even Tennessee, you know. John Hyden's got his beach gig over there and he's getting some great players from there. But these girls or, you know, if there were guys programs, I'm sure they would be too, but they're being recruited to play at the top 20 schools in beach volleyball. And you're seeing the talent really emerge at younger levels, which is so fun to watch. Um, funny story. Uh, I worked in 2018, 19 at a beach tournament and, uh, met two teams competing in the medal round of the gold medal match. Uh, those names, Delaney Maple, Megan Kraft, Lexi Denneberg, Riley Powers. That's a USC versus UCLA, but kept a relationship with them. Just, you know, talking about stuff as their careers went on in college and seeing where they, they're, they're at right now, which they're all going to be competing for a national championship. I mean, yeah, they got the conference tournament going on, but seeing how good they were then, and where they are now is such a testament to 
how fast the game is growing and how much better the athletes are getting before getting into college. <laughs> yeah. Shout out to those athletes that you just mentioned who are in the USA Volleyball Pipeline as well. And then we've had Megan Kraft on the podcast too. Uh, uh, that was a great episode having her on. But like you mentioned, yeah, just so cool to see where beach collegiate volleyball was in those early days when you had, you know, indoor players playing beach too. Still have a little bit of that now, but now with the the boom of club volleyball and, and beach uh, being added to those club volleyball um, programs, you're seeing athletes being recruited just for beach uh, and that level of play is just skyrocketed uh, because of that. So uh, thank you for pointing that out. That uh, Yeah, I, it's, it's going to be a very exciting tournament uh, to watch. Well, there's a uh, Gulf Shores uh, is going to be a beatdown. <laughs> I mean, it's there are teams that are upsetting yeah. each other there as well. And yeah, there's the powerhouses of UCLA and USC, but really making a big jump this year has been Stanford. And then, of course, you got TCU, right. uh, Cal Poly, a little Big West school that could, you know, Coach Todd Rogers, which I mean, gosh, we've heard his name somewhere. Oh, former. Where Olympia. do I know that from? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, he's he's really put together a good team, and um, he's got a hodgepodge of some mix of graduate students and some young players. But I mean, just watching what what Todd does for these players and how much his players respect him, I mean, it doesn't surprise me that they've got they tied their highest ranking in program history at number four in the ABCA poll. But I mean, they're out to do some damage and. If a team sleeps on them, they they better watch out. <laughs> ah, I love the I love that format too of the tournament. And, and Gulf Shores is such a great venue for it. Uh, beautiful beach uh, there if you haven't been. But that format is is really cool with five pairs. You know, you're playing a best of five uh, between those pairs. So when you know one match ends, those teams are running over to the other court to to watch. Um, the, their teammates play and uh, it, and the fans too are running over from court to court which is it's really cool to watch uh and have you have you ever been to the tournament i know you watch it uh from your from your mc <laughs> announcing station at, at the men's but yeah uh could you speak to that to, to, to the format uh, as well well since the, the inception of gulf shores i've been at every ncaa men's indoor championship which is on the <laughs> same weekend hello plenty yeah. many come on come uh, on but i'm watching it and I love that format. That's yeah. part of the reason why I enjoy it so much because working as a MC host or doing play by play for beach duels, especially when they have uh, two waves of flights going, we'll all have the twos, four, twos and fours go first and then the uh, ones, threes and fives. So you, you'll come out of the first wave of flights, twos and fours are tied at one dual point apiece. Now we entered our second wave of flights since our, Ones, threes, and fives. Oh, looks like the number five pair just got that point. Two, one, so and so. Oh, wait, but now the number threes got that point. Side two, two dual points apiece, in which you referenced to all the people are running to the number one score to see who's <laughs> going to get that point. And it's even more amazing when it goes to the third set tiebreak, yeah, who's extended yeah. set. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but it's such an exciting atmosphere when it gets down to that final duel and i mean there's nothing better you know that the entire teams rooting for their girls the crowds all into it and as a mc host i'm like getting into it all excited and you know, at that point i'm not rooting for a team anymore i'm like i'm rooting for the game you know <laughs> it's a timeout at the in a men's match and you just hear you on the mic hot mic just <laughs> screaming yelling about what's going on the beach maybe <laughs> Uh, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I guess anything, you know, we want to talk a little bit about your podcast as well, but anything about the men's or beach tournaments that are going on, we got to split those up, like you mentioned, but, uh, anything <laughs> last that you'd like to, any last words you'd like to say about either one of those tournaments before we move on here? Well, for the men's side, I definitely encourage you guys. I mean, I've been trying to get this hashtag. I don't even know if they're a sponsor, but I gotta say, cause that's what I use, but greatest show on Terraflex is men's volleyball. <laughs> cool. <laughs> I mean, you're seeing probably the highest level of physicality and you're getting some giants on the court that have excellent mechanics and technique who have high volley IQs going at it. And that's why they're playing a national championship. But in the same respect, you've got some of the best Libros and ball control people in the nation in those Libros and the setters. So uh, <clears throat> you may think a ball's down, like you'll see some guy crush a ball to 79, 85 miles per hour 
But then, oh, wait, it got popped up by that little six one Libero, and the setter is going to throw a shoot set to the pin and get the point anyway. So it doesn't matter. So, uh, you know, the game is so fast, so powerful. You got to watch men's volleyball if you haven't done so already. And uh, on the on the beach side, in we already talked about that format. It's exciting to watch, but again, watch what these players are doing on the court. Their ball control is amazing. And even the strategy of the game has transformed quite a bit in the last few years where they're doing a lot more option balling on two and even over on one, which we're seeing internationally quite a bit, um, a fast and furious offense. Again, you do that in the indoor game because you have six players and you run quicks, but you start seeing this in the beach. I'm like, that just shows the ball control is getting so good in the game and defense and transition is entertaining to watch because they'll run these backslides, you know, the, you got the one-on-one blocks and being able to read and, you know, fit, you know, faux blocking, stepping away, like they're going to pull on defense, but go up and press over and deny someone. It's all exciting to me. So I love seeing these little intricacies of the game transpire and even see the strategy and beach because you see one blocker call one way they're going to do a read you see the defender fake left go right you know <clears throat> so uh, maybe that's just the volley nerd in me but there's so much happening in that <laughs> mm-hmm. you mentioned all those terms and everything and I was, yeah all the volley nerds listening just sat up a little bit <laughs> <laughs> well the volleyball terminology is the other thing that all the grip the, the lingo like hey that's chowder oh, yeah, shit, that ball <laughs> yeah, the sand yeah. monster got you. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Yeah, let's. Uh, I mean, yeah, definitely a great weekend of volley coming up here soon. Uh, definitely check out the men's tournament, and if you you're going to recognize that voice that you're hearing uh, in the arena uh, right here on the podcast, and then yeah, check out the the beach tournament as well. It's going to be a lot of fun. Great weekend of volley, like we've been talking about, but. Let's move over into podcasting as well. You you kind of tease it a little bit. You just uh, did your, I don't know what you're going to call it, Selection Sunday recap type type podcast episode. But yeah, could you just talk a little bit about the Viral Volley podcast, what you're doing there? Okay, so Viral Volley uh, podcast started pre-COVID. Um, the way that started out was on volleyballmag.com they had a show college volleyball weekly which was started by kevin barnett back in i want to say 2009 ish 2006 or 2009 one of those two and he'd let me know because i was a contributor on the college volleyball weekly segment that he's going to be retiring the show and i'm like gosh i I don't want to see the coverage for men's fade away so uh lee feinswag of volleyball mag said hey would you be willing to do the interview segment for volleyball mag I'm like sure i'm like well if i'm going to be talking to him i might as well turn it into a podcast episode so that's how it first started and that was in uh that was conceived in november of 2019 so i you know spent a long time thinking about like you know i gotta do it whether i want to or not i gotta do this because the game can't suffer any le- or have less media so i'm like i'll do it um well obviously something big happened in the world and (laughs) and we started getting these grumblings of a virus that was coming around in late november and even early december of covid you know i was like i happen to remember seeing a tweet from cnn i'm like you know so i think he was a a, someone saying hey watch out for this like oh no big deal so um i decided to run with it like let's do college volleyball weekly but let me do a test episode um my first podcast guest was tina gradina of a then usc who plays beach volleyball for lot now which is one of the relationships i always try to keep in contact with her because she does such great stuff and is a great person to talk to and um <clears throat> as i got into that more and more uh made connection with dan friend of lewis because they happened to be playing in long beach towards the end of december at the start of the men's season so i said well would you be willing to come on weekly it's like yeah and uh, from there, I said, well, who else do I know in the men's volleyball world really well? Well, Jay Hostick of George Mason used to be an assistant coach at UC Irvine, was one of the associate coaches at Irvine Valley College, and um, just known him for a really long time, fellow surfer. So he was an, a natural fit. And then I knew Dave Hunt, who at the time was in Pepperdine, now an associate co- coach at um, 
Texas. So that was my original podcast crew. And uh, from there, we just ran with it. You know, I got, you know, it started small as always, but as the word started to get out, we started to get more and more listeners. And, um, you know, it was great until the world shut down on May 15th. Or was that May? Yeah, May 15th. I rem- uh, remember That's being right. at a beach duel at USC, a pretty major one too, at LMU, USC, Pepperdine, and UCLA, all there. So you remember a dad courtside saying, oh, no way, they just shut down the Mavericks Jazz game because someone tested positive for COVID. And from there, I mean, obviously we know what happened. So yep. <clears throat> with that, everything shut down. And I was like, well, shoot, I got to keep these. I want to keep the conversation on volleyball. So I'm like, well, maybe I don't do college volleyball weekly and do just a volleyball podcast. So I had potential Olympians, uh, Sarah Hughes, Kelly Clays, uh, Brandy Wilkerson, um, you know, and then anyone else who wanted to come on. You know, that was that new from college, even some collegiate players. And that's how it really transformed. Um, Carrie Walsh Jennings, April Ross, uh, they they all came on at one point uh, during that the when the world was cl- shut down. So you know that was exciting to be able to have those kind of guests on there, get more eyes on it on beach volleyball and indoor volleyball. What would you say? I mean, from maybe start. I know we we in very much detail talk about the stint, uh, you know, with COVID and the shutdown, how that affected things. We got rolling into now. Um, what would you kind of say your main focus of of the podcast is and how has that changed throughout the years or evolved i'll say <laughs> at first i didn't know what i was doing so i had no expectations <laughs> but as i get more focused like people just want to hear the discussion of um you know there there are times when we'll go very stat heavy performance heavy but then we'll get into the stories uh, the news around what's happening in the world of volleyball um, you know, like the big things to the small things, like things like Stanford cutting their program in during COVID and rallying support for that to, you know, the Camden Gianni story about where he is at with his heart surgery and his heart situation um, to even just recently, uh, there was a uh, Nick Eichelberger of uh, Emmanuel University, you know, he wanted to do a suicide awareness. It just kind of is on the fly type thing. I've never really set a format, but we will discuss results. That's a given top performers. And then I'll let the coaches, you know, promote their programs because they're, they're contributing their time. It's like, you know, if I paid them, give a hundred percent raise, it's still about to zero, you know, so <laughs> guys are doing it because they love the game. And that's why I think it works so well. We all are on the same page. Saying like, we know there's not going to be a paycheck in this, but we're doing this in the interest of growing the game of volleyball, getting it out there in people's uh, in the forefront of people's eyes. And with that understanding, it's, you know, I think that that's where I've learned. It's like not give the people what they want, but just be real. Mm-hmm. You know, they want the results. We'll, we're sure get that, but we're going to be ourselves and, you know, we're tell it the way it is, so to speak. Do you have a, like a favorite guest or a favorite moment or topic that you've done on your show? Um, this sticks yeah, out for you. Yes. I mean, I, I know that the guests are all making a sacrifice to come on. I mean, you know, versus what they get in the rest of the world. Cause obviously unless you follow international volleyball, you don't see the kind of attention these players really get. The United States kind of doesn't pay as much attention. It's not a knock. I just think there's so many other things distracting the American viewer. Yeah. But, I mean, they're like big stars in other countries. Yeah. You know, if you want to get a microcosm of it, Go to Hawaii, say you're on the volleyball team, you'll be treated like a rock star. That's how these players are treated out and abroad. So um, unfortunately, we don't get that here on the mainland. So is there a big guess? Mm, yeah, you know, the players that are getting the award, sure. But I think there's stories to everyone, you know, and I I, I want to treat them all the same. Yeah, there are people who want to definitely get out there to get more eyes on volleyball. I was going to say the podcast, but the podcast has never been about me. Yeah, I just, I have an interest in what they're doing as people and how they're performing on the world stage or even just like talk family stuff if needed, you know, because the fact of the matter is there's no volleyball to talk about in the shutdown years. So we were talking about things that are going through, how they became better players, 
what were some key components to their success? You know, like, cause Micah Christensen, you know, obviously there was a time when, when the, uh, there were some, a very touchy situation in Russia, uh, and couldn't really speak openly about it, but you can get the sense, like, I got to be careful and I had to respect that. Mm-hmm. But the fact is he's going through that, that time, you know, and you know, there's, there's in Bowl Turkey had a bombing incident at one point. I happened to be interviewing, uh, Haley Washington, uh, shortly after that happened. So I try to bring in the life perspective as well, because it's like, you know, there's life outside of volleyball, but definitely if we go that way, sure. If not, I'm cool with that too. Yeah. I think that's, that was kind of like our focus when we started the podcast too, is just, you know, we want to talk volley, we want to, you know, give these athletes who are so great on the court a platform to, you know, talk about themselves too off the court. You know, what are the, what are their interests? You know, a lot of them have businesses, uh, families, you know, like you mentioned off the court that, that a lot of the listeners fans just don't know about. Um, but I think that just helps elevate the game and for the listener, for the fan to get to know those athletes a little bit better so that when they see them, you know, playing volleyball, they're like, you know, a little bit more connected to that athlete, uh, maybe have some similarities or, um, some similar interest or, or anything like that, but yeah, just helping spread, you know, the love of volleyball and, and what sure. the sport is, uh, is just, you know, our goal and giving the athletes just one more platform to get their names out there Our you know, in coaches too, our, all of our guests, you know, just another That's platform. I like podcast yeah. or podcast, whatever you call it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a, you know, just speaking of guests, but do you have like a white whale that you're, you're chasing the, to bring on to the podcast? Ours is Tom Selleck. Uh, we're trying to get Tom on the, on the podcast. <laughs> well, the thing is like, I, yeah, I saw that question. Like that's a tough one. That's a yeah. really, really tough one. And I don't say it to like, you know, duck out on it. I mean, when you got names like Karch Karai out there and yeah, Kerry Walsh Jennings, April Ross, Misty May, you know, you got Matt Anderson. It's like, how do you choose? So I actually have a different criteria. To me, I love humor. So mm. one of the funniest people to follow, um, and I think <laughs> the reason why I always watch when she puts something out, like Haley Washington. Yeah. <laughs> it's like countdown to my next Chipotle burrito. I'm like, what? <laughs> That's what you're looking forward to. You know, obviously, because I play abroad and always fun to follow her stuff. And, you know, it's, uh, yeah, there, there's some great storytellers out there. One that I just, you know, she kind of lays low, but when she puts stuff out there, it's so good. Kelsey Cook or Robinson. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, I mean, she is a wonderful photographer and she's like great fashion sense. And I never thought I'd be liking that stuff. It doesn't help that if you're pretty, but I mean, you look at the quality of what she's posting. I'm like, wow, you know, she's got a really artistic eye and can beat the tar out of the ball. So, yeah, you know, it's, uh, you know, I like watching, following her stuff on, the guys site aren't as active, but if there are some guys uh, I had to put down there, the Mike Ahmad is boys at out of system. Right. <laughs> <All these entertaining. laughs> yep. They signed them. So they've signed on some new athletes to do some stuff them this summer. And I'm like, so you guys can carry that on your own though. I mean, you see the Worsley brothers and Micah and then the, their back crew. They're always fun to follow. So, but I think any USA volleyball player, if they're posting, I'm, I'm watching and following. TJ DeFalco, David Smith is, I mean, what's this, a 20, 20 year career so far? Yeah. You know, you know, it's, and seeing all the new USA talent that's out there, you know, Chiaco Bolu, she's always fun to, to see uh, in her Turkish teams. And because of those connections, it, like I'm now even more connected, not only the USA players, but get to know some of the international players, you know, when they come out for friendly, it's like, Hey, what's going on? So it's like, you know, the connection that we make from social media and through the players is just, it's how intertwined it is, is mind blowing. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, that's agreed. I mean, I feel like we've covered so much, like over the course of this interview, you're talking about, uh, you know, your podcast, men's national championship, beach national championships, your start to announcing your connection to USA volleyball, everything in between. And, uh, before, you know, we kind of wrap things up, do you have, you know, anything else you want to leave on the table? Um, is your opportunity to do more, more shameless slugging? Selfless shameless, shameless self promotion. We can talk for literally days. I have this like make this like a five part series or something like that. But if you got, what would I do? I think, um, more than anything else, if I can just 
ask your listeners and viewers, go out and follow the athletes you like in volleyball. Go and click and like and share stuff from USA Volleyball and any of these athletes, their teams, their social media, because honestly, their only measurement of success and people following is what you guys are engaging with on their media. Um, it takes, they, they sacrifice quite a bit. They're training hard to, to be the best versions of themselves they can be. And, and it shows every day they the play is getting better and better and better. And he, you can call me out on it. Just look at footage from volleyball in volleyball from a few years ago versus what we're seeing now. You can't deny the fact that people are getting more better, uh, better and excelling in the game. So do that little bit of support. Go and support our athletes, our teams, the teams uh, and their schools that are supporting them um, and the organizations that are getting the game out there. Um, drop a note every once in a while. Just let them know that you're out there because uh, there's some really great personalities in the game of volleyball and not just at the USAV level, but I mean, throughout Collegiate Beach and um, they're all, once you start having that conversation there, you can learn a ton from them. Yeah. And who knows? You may uh, run into them on the beach near you or an indoor court near you. So, uh, and then for USA Volleyball, you know, when they're in town, go and support the events. If you're within driving distance, go to the events. Um, and that's for the indoor men's and women's teams and the, all the beach teams because the Olympics are coming up. They need to know that you're out there. And, uh, and after what happened this this last Olympics, I mean, the war, basically no fans, I'm sure you're going to be looking forward to having be playing in front of people this year. You know, yeah. that'll change the dynamic for, I think, everyone that's competing there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could have said it better myself. Yeah, exciting <laughs> year for volleyball with the yeah. Olympics and Paralympics coming up here. Uh, and just hopefully just see the, the growth of the game continue to grow uh, with the Olympics and Paralympics coming up. But uh, speaking of follows, shares, likes, where can people follow you? Uh, you know, as you're traveling here and there to all these events and announcing and everything and, and supporting your content as well. The ultimate shameless self-promotion <laughs> segment. Uh, it's always uncomfortable. But if you really wanted to see, you know, really put to poorly put together hodgepodge variety of posts, you, on Instagram, it's at the Rob on the mic. Uh, most active there, uh, Rob on the mic on Twitter, because my, Ironically, two summers ago at BNL, my Instagram account got hacked. Oh, so uh, I actually uh, remember I, that. I remember that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and my phone got ripped off too. It was like a double yep. way weekend in Shreveport. So, <laughs> We're on. but yeah, you can definitely follow those areas, but I'm more than me. I mean, I try and get what news I, I get and catches my eye on there, but uh, follow your teams first and foremost. And then uh, I'll try and get that content up to you. And even little snippets of this podcast right here, you know, these two uh, handsome gentlemen on screen with me and Curtis hiding in the back. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got to get your name out there even more so that more people can see your backpack and run into you uh, on the beach mm -hmm. there. <laughs> with their French. <laughs> make that connection. With their... <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> Well, Rob, thank you so much for for spending the time to take to to sit down here and talk with us about men's and beach uh, college volleyball and the, and the tournaments coming up. Uh, appreciate it so much. Hey, yeah, uh, it's been an honor to be your guys' guest, both you, uh, Stephen and Clarence. Uh, appreciate just being able to take uh, what, over an hour now with me because I'm sure it's just psycho babble. <laughs> I love it. I love it. The volley nerds are loving it. Don't worry. <laughs> we'll definitely have to have you back on to continue this conversation uh, for uh, for future episodes. But thank you so much, and and look forward to seeing you too at, a, at an event here soon, hopefully, uh, so we can chat in person. Yeah, I'm hoping as well. I mean, I'd love to see some USA indoor events come locally. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, That's right. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Yep. Thank you so much, Rob. Thanks, Rob. We'll talk to you later. Another great guest for episode 91 here uh, on, on the podcast. But yeah, thank you so much to Rob for, for taking the time to sit down with us. He's running all over the place, too. He's a very busy, busy man uh, in uh, in the MC announcing scene, uh, especially with uh, collegiate volleyball here coming to a close with the, the men's championship in the beach as well. But uh Great to learn more from Rob too. I, I've run into Rob many times uh, at events, uh, national, both national team and collegiate. And um, 
a lot I didn't know about his background too. Uh, loved hearing him talk about how he started off in baseball and then eventually found volleyball as well. I loved when his little side note there. I was, I think I asked, well, you know, what was the biggest obstacle transitioning from baseball to, to volleyball? And he said his disappointment from his parents. <laughs> 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 so that was funny. But uh, no, no, it, he he had a he had a great uh, and you know great time playing baseball and then also played volleyball and just found his love and passion for the game there and you know that's kind of what springboarded him into getting more involved uh, with volleyball uh, you know from officiating to I believe and then into um, uh, announcing and emceeing events uh, so yeah great to great to learn more about his background um, it just goes to show that like everyone you know, has a different path, you know, in volleyball. And it's, it's so interesting to, to bring these guests on and hear more about that. It's so unique. And it's just mm-hmm. it was so unique too. And I also just love how he dissected, uh, just the breakdown of the men's tournament now, uh, and how we're up from seven teams to now eight and, uh, you know, got a first time HBCU in the mix as well. And he, he did a really good job of shouting out the athletes and really, you know, mentioning the notable assets and situations going into each match and you know i just can't wait to see how that kind of either comes to life or we're gonna have to pop a fall and say hey what happened here you said this and you were wrong I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> but uh but yeah no i mean you know he he knows his stuff and uh you can tell rob's always been passionate about it and uh just a genuinely great guy to have and uh you guys if you guys see him around walter pyramid as he's doing his thing on the microphone uh, say hi, say what's up to him. You know, I'm sure he'll just love to spark up any conversation and just, you know, get to know you as much as you want to get to know him for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent preview, uh, of the men's championship from Rob and, um, talked a lot about just the depth of, of talent, uh, among the, the programs and, yeah. and men's volleyball and some good teams were left out, you know, mentioning <laughs> specifically Hawaii too, who had, you know, some injury problems throughout the season, but, um, that just shows, you know, the growth of men's volleyball and how strong it's getting. And hopefully down the road, you know, we added one team this year um, to the tournament, now up to eight teams in the tournament and the bracket, but hopefully we continue to add more teams um, and just continue that growth of, of yeah. men's volleyball. You know, it's starting, mm-hmm. we're seeing it at the grassroots level into junior boys too. Uh, the tournaments are getting bigger. The teams are getting better. The athletes are getting better. Um, and I, I mean, that's just the growth of the game right there that we're seeing. And even going back to our last guest, uh, Jeff Jendrick, who, you know, the resources that are available for these athletes, uh, to learn volleyball and, and get better at volleyball and fine tuning those, those little details on the court. Uh, and Jeff is one of those resources for them, you know, giving back to the community and, uh, helping those athletes out. But yeah, hopefully continue to see uh those teams um more teams in the tournament you know let's let's skip 12 let's let's just throw 16 teams in there let's go <laughs> I mean, yeah i was gonna say something like 20 whenever <laughs> it's oh it. yeah yeah but yeah thanks again to rob for for taking the time to sit down with us and, and chat uh, ahead of this tournament and um looking forward to watching both the men's ncaa championship this week and the women's beach as well um and both those, uh, you can catch all the action on ESPN as well, which is great for the sport. Uh, but yeah, thank you again to Rob. And hopefully we'll see Rob down the road in person and we can we can chat more. All right. I think about, thanks about that time to uh, let him know what's, what's coming up. What events we got coming up? Uh, go ahead and kick us off. Let's, Let's jump around. into it. <laughs> I just, I love, I love just thinking back of that, that memory, uh, <laughs> our first ABCA and, and that being on my cup, my, <laughs> my coffee cup. <laughs> Good times. Good times. All right. Yeah. Now on to, uh, upcoming events. The, we have the beach NTDP accelerator, May 3rd in Gulf Shores, Alabama, USA volleyball beach tour, Gulf coast beach fest, national qualifier, May 3rd through the 5th, also in Gulf Shores, Alabama. The Girls Indoor NTDP Spring Training Series, May 10th through the 13th in Bradenton, Florida. The Coach Observation Session Indoor Girls NTDP Training, uh, May 11th through the 12th in Bradenton, Florida as well. 
the USA Volleyball Beach Tour at Chesapeake Wave Summer National Qualifier May 11th through the 12th in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. And the Boys U19 Norseka Continental Championship May 12th through the 20th in Puerto Rico. And we're getting a live update here. We have the Boys U19 National Team Training Block in Anaheim, California, May 3rd through the 11th. Good luck to everyone competing in those events. More details on all upcoming events can be found at our website at usavolleyball.org. It's definitely event season. We're in we're deep in the swing of things right now. All right. Now on to the pro side of things. There are quite a few events here. Um, in addition to that, uh, we have the Beach Pro Tour Elite 16 Brasilia, uh, May 1st through the 5th in, you guessed it, Brazil. Uh, 2024 Narseca Vadero, May 2nd through the 6th in Cuba. After that, we have the Narseca Punta Cana, number one in Punta Cana, Dominican Republic, from May 7th through the 11th. Uh, we have the Futures Madrid men only from May 9th through the 12th in Madrid, Spain. After that, we have the Futures Pink Ten in uh, Pink Ten, China, from May 9th through the 12th. Now, following that one around the same time frame, uh, we have the Norseca Punta Cana number two uh, from May 11th through the 15th in Punta Cana, Dominican Republic. Good luck to all of those athletes competing. Go to some beautiful destinations there and safe travels while you uh, travel to your destinations. Uh, check out more information on usavolleyball.org for also, uh, also for men's and women's national team updates from their pro leagues too. Uh, remember, listeners, you guys can rate, review, share this podcast with your friends, families, teammates, because it really, 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 really helps us grow this podcast and reach new listeners, especially as we start to close in on that episode number 100. Um, also, remember to check out our video episodes on our website and on the YouTube. We thank you all for your continued support there. If you know of a club that should be featured, a uh, story you'd like us to share, topics you want to hear about, make sure you email us at the USA Volleyball Show.org and leave us feedback. Let us know how we're doing. And again, we want to hear about those topics to get them on our episode list. Um, remember, new episodes drop every other week. And until then, thank you for listening to another episode of the USA Volleyball Show podcast. We are the official podcast of USA Volleyball. That was my You're Watching Disney channel. Um, that was good. <laughs> That's a throwback. <laughs> <laughs> this has been the USA Volleyball Show with Clarence Hughes and Stephen Munson. Produced by Curtis Ward. Our content producer is Lara Fawcett. Our marketing lead is Bree J. Cox. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to rate and review. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to the USA Volleyball Show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts.